All right, we're back with another Fermat Friday. Today, I've got Lex joining us, who is our director of marketing. But the reason I want to have Lex on the show is because she is formally a creative strategist. And I'm seeing this title come up everywhere on social. Lex, I know you've had a couple kind of like banger posts about this topic as well. So, uh, <laughs> well, maybe some <laughs> upper upper mid posts about, about this topic. Um, but... Yeah, Lex, you want to give just kind of like a quick intro um, about where you were before Vermont and like how you know so much about this this role in this world? Yeah, totally. So, hey, everybody watching this, I'm Lex. As Alex said, I'm currently the director of marketing at Vermont, but um, I had a very unique journey in e-com where I actually, actually started in CX years and years and years ago and kind of crawled my way up. Um, but where I spent most of my career, like in the growth marketing side, when I was working at brands was in this role of a creative strategist. Um, after that, then I went on to be head of brand at Triple Whale, director of marketing at Stay AI, and then director of marketing here at Vermont. So I've got both the brand and the SaaS side uh, to kind of speak to not only the evolution of this role, but the evolution of the market over time. And so interesting journey kind of played on both sides. We played in SaaS, we played in brand, been on like, I know you have to dig through the data. You got to put stuff together. Like, tell me about the creative strategist role. Like, I feel this is a role that more and more people are looking for, but like, what is it in your mind? Yeah. So when I started as a creative strategist, what it really meant was a lot of research and ideation um, in order to support content development for ad creative. It's evolved so much since then. So now I kind of think of it as like a four, four core function role. Um, so you're still doing research. So a creative strategist is responsible for like deeply understanding your brand's customer, your market, your industry, really doing things like conducting customer interviews and reading CX tickets and reading customer reviews, um, doing ext extensive competitive research. Um, so there's like that whole research piece. Then there's the ideation piece. So it's like applying your learnings and consumer psychology um, to really draft compelling narratives around your product that you're offering or your products and why someone should buy. So you're just constantly conceptualizing like new ways to sell the product, new presentations for that messaging or those product visuals um, throughout kind of the shopping experience. Then there's execution. So depending on if your creative strategist also doubles, body doubles is like a media buyer or growth marketer. It depends on where their breadth kind of goes. Um, but in my role, I was writing creative briefs to hand off then to creators to develop assets as well as designers to edit and create video and static assets that we ran as ads. Um, and then also working with media buyers to make sure that the ads were being placed and targeted to the right people that we wanted to target them to. And then the last big piece is this kind of data brain piece where you're working on analysis and optimization. So you're doing performance analysis of the creative that you've deployed, the pieces within the creative, the creative as a whole. Um, so like those visual assets, the messaging, even down to the CTAs. Um, and then you're just constantly optimizing, right? So you're like constantly searching for the ad that you can scale beyond belief um, or the messaging angle or like creators in the visuals that are going to perform the best that you can choose the most out of. And so there's like literally optimization in building the assets and launching the assets, but then there's, there's kind of organizational efficiency and optimization and like, how do we work with the right people to create the right content that hits the right audience that also doesn't just get them to buy, but gets them to buy a whole lot of stuff. Right. So it's like, actually the role goes pretty deep. And I think that's why there are a lot of people looking for creative strategists right now. Um, and it's hard to find them because they have to be able to combine this data driven brain, which I think is probably like, 60 to 70 percent of the role and then the rest of the role is like the more fun kind of creative stuff where you're ideating yeah a little bit of an artist a little bit of a scientist at the same time like those four core pillars when you said hey like if you're getting someone who's like also doubling as the growth marketer or like the media buyer here like when you see creative strategist roles going up or like people in this role like are you are we seeing a desire to have that same person be the person who's executing on like the buys and like actually owning the ad account? Or is it usually someone who's like interfacing with that person? Yeah, 
I think, it, first of all, it just depends on like the business and their operational efficiency goals, right? So are they trying to keep their team as lean as possible? Or are they trying to build their assets and build their ad strategy in-house, maybe with that strategist, but then have someone else deploy and manage their ads, be it an agency, a contractor, or a whole human, um, an FTE, right? So <laughs> um, it really just depends on how the business wants to operate. But what I've found particularly in D2C in the past three to five years is just everybody's constantly leaning down. They're, they're leaning down every part of their whole business stack that they can um, and trying to find whether it's a tech solution or an employee, someone who can wear multiple hats, right? It's like the startup dream is like the one guy that wears eight hats. Um, and so in my role, I, when I started as a creative strategist, I was working with someone who was a media buyer, but I think that the role of a media buyer has also evolved um, in the sense that the, the ad platforms, the paid social platforms are so much more driven now by like AI and kind yeah. of less targeting, like just going broad. And so your media buying strategy is still, it's still relevant, but it's not like as you're not going as deep on the media buying strategy as you are on the creative strategy. That's why everyone likes to say the creative is the new targeting though. They've been saying that for five years, but, um, <laughs> and so I think, um, realistically now like there are many brands who are looking for a one one stop shop kind of role um which is no easy task as somebody who has done it and to and done both of those roles it is a lot of work particularly for a high growth high velocity brand um but it's it's definitely doable as one person <laughs> i think where it gets really interesting and i think where we're going to go today is you know, the role of the creative strategist is now evolving beyond just the ad creative itself and further and deeper through the funnel. And so then it becomes like, you know, do you want this one team member or maybe a couple of the creative strategists to be responsible for like pretty much the entire breadth of the acquisition process? Um, Cause that's like a whole lot of responsibility. And also as a business, a lot of trust and faith that you're putting into like one person on your marketing team, you know? Yeah, it's interesting when you talked about like, hey, we're kind of like AI-ifying or like creative is the new targeting. Like definitely agree with that. Like you're seeing creative velocity being like the driver on this. So like, hey, I just need to get as, like I want to try as many things as possible. My one worry is like, there's kind of this uh, trend now for like the ugly ads. So like, I'm like, oh yeah, we'll just get our creative strategist, like even just like put the creative together and kind of like own the whole thing, which might be a little problematic. But I think like, because of how the ad account is changing and like there's just the algorithms getting better just like keep feeding it and it kind of like self optimizes is i know like motion um the creative analytics is like big on this it's like trying to make creatives have more of like that data insight and like understand how that's working because i think that might actually be the path forward is like having someone who can make those like understand the impact rather than like i think it'd be easy I don't know if easier is the right word, but I think it's more viable to have that person understand the data than to necessarily have like the person who understands the ad account all of a sudden become yeah. a creative. Yeah, I totally agree. I actually, I mean, obviously it really depends on the person, right? But it's like easier to kind of learn some of those like hard skills, the data and analytics piece than it is to train someone who is extremely data driven to somehow like become creative and conceptualize and idealize, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like I get that way. I think it's, it's much easier to go one way than the other. So if I were hiring for this role myself today, I would much rather hire someone who probably leaves heavier on like consumer psychology and the ability to create and ideate and then teach them the data skills or support them in, in coming up to see the data skills. I think where it gets really interesting though, is like in this market of creative strategies versus growth and media buyers, there's always this kind of push pull. This is something that you and I talk a lot about, Alex, where the incentives for two different roles that might work in-house together um, aren't necessarily aligned, right? Because your creative strategist, if that person is really optimizing towards producing the best creative, they're just looking at different performance metrics often than your growth performance media buyer. Um, and so you get this kind of like, I give this tug of war analogy where your creative strategist is like, I need the best click through rate. I need the best like hook or hold rate. You know, I'm, they're very much looking at these super top of funnel engagement metrics, whereas your performance oriented marketer, your media buyer, they're probably looking at stuff like revenue per session, maybe even, or like ROAS, if that's what your brand is using as a North star. And so while your creative is trying to develop 
the best creative that can capture the most audiences and have the most breadth and still get people to the landing page, your performance marketer is like, okay, I'm working with the resources that I have. I have a couple different landing pages or I'm able to create funnels, right? So how do I map the right creative to the right landing experiences so that I can actually convert and make more money? Um, and that's kind of one of the things that I think, and one of the reasons that I came to Vermont, one of the things that I think is so exciting about Vermont is that when you're able to give your team the resource to kind of bridge that gap so it's less of a tug of war between those potentially competing interests, then you're far more likely to succeed. And also it just uncaps scale in a, in an, a completely new way, right? So all of these cool creative concepts, all this consumer psychology and consumer research that you have, you can now build, you know, high converting funnels for, as opposed to just having to work with the creatives that work best with, you know, the one landing page you've been refining for the past year. Yeah, I love that. I call it owning the outcome. Is like you, I, you want your create, you want your creative strategist or creative to be able to own the outcome of like, hey, I'm going to put something together that actually drives revenue. But you also want to put your performance marketer or your growth marketer, whoever's looking at those efficiency metrics, to like go the other way as well. Um, so stop the tug of war and just like allow both those people to to own the outcome. And I think like yeah. it's 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 really interesting. Cause like at the beginning of the conversation, you were saying, Hey, the role of a creative strategist, like, let's do the, let's do the interviews. Let's go do the, re like, let's find these value props. Let's find these things is like, I think that is the ultimate goal of any D to C business, right? Is like, I always want to be in pursuit of additional revenue or like net new, like incrementality is a big thing. Right. And like, if I'm able mm -hmm. to go find a new audience or like go, go speak in a different way that attracts someone net new, that's going to be good for my business. But to your point is if you're the creative strategist finding all these like new angles that you can use or like, Hey, we could potentially sell this to this group of people. And you put together those amazing strategies and like you put the creative together, great hook rate, great click through rate, falling apart. Performance marketer is going to call you up and be like, yo, Lex, this ad sucks. No yeah. one's converting, but like it, maybe it doesn't suck. Maybe you are potentially about to unlock a net new revenue stream if you were able to line up what that ad was talking about to the appropriate experience on the post click. Cause if I'm talking about something that I'm driving to a funnel that is not relevant or maybe only pseudo relevant, then I'm not going to get what I need. Like my efficiency is going to look like trash, even though I might be yeah. like so close to unlocking something new. Dude, you're speaking my language. The last D to C brand that I worked at, um, where I was kind of running this growth function, um, one of the requests from my leadership team was basically to come, there was like one hero product. It was a, a kid's multivitamin. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with the vitamin and supplement world, it's like, it, it's beautiful some days and really difficult the other days, but multivitamins are like the hardest supplement to sling. You cannot change my mind because you can't feel the effects of it. You don't know if it's actually doing anything. You're just hoping it's helping your health, right? People like bounce between different brands all the time because they're all like, I don't know which one like tastes better or sucks less to swallow. Like, you know, <laughs> so I was working with this kid's multivitamin brand and we wanted to create five new angles to message that product to parents every single week. That was like the task. But we were often sending to one or two landing pages that were built around a core messaging angle or tried to combine a bunch into one. Um, or to our PDP, which is like, this is a kid's multivitamin and it helps their health all around, right? So when you build these like really banger angles with this really compelling creative that's like, if your kid is nutrient deficient, they might not sleep well. That was one of the big angles that we were testing is like, it might keep them restless at night, all this stuff. And then you send them through a funnel that isn't congruent. These parents were like, I thought we were talking about sleep. What are we doing here on this landing page about how it's a gummy vitamin full of fruits and veggies? It's like, yeah, it is. But, you know, that's a really confusing buyer journey or buyer experience. Um, and so one of the coolest things that I've been able to do in, in my role here and work at Vermont is watch even like supplement brands specifically do exactly what I wish I could have done um, my, my, in my role where I was like churning creative constantly, right? Just trying to get something to convert where... Um, I'm not, I can't remember if we have it in our past Vermont Friday or not yet, but um, we work with a, a wellness brand called My Body Green. They have a variety of different supplements that can 
be used for a variety of different functional benefits. And so they've literally been able to map their ad creative to an advertorial, to a full funnel, all the way end to end. That's that product for that specific use case for that specific demo. Oh my gosh. If I had access to that when I was like building all these funnel or building all these ads back in the day, of course my conversion rate would have been so much better, right? Like just that, that congruent experience from end to end where somebody's telling you this product is going to help you for this thing. Like, of course we should all be doing that. Right. It seems so, seems so simple. The, the specificity of it, right. It's like you were saying like, Hey, it's for this use case for this person. And it's this product and like being able to point to that. I think like the sleep example is a really good one. Like, Hey, like this is going to help you with sleep. Like if I see an ad and I'm currently struggling with that problem, or I see value yeah. in that particular angle, if it doesn't match like exact, like if I'm here to talk about my sleep problems and I don't hit something that is immediately talking to me about sleep problems, what, what are we doing here? Like I'm, I'm clearly going to bounce, but like, Hey, if that, like you were saying, like, Hey, we're looking for five different angles a week. Like Godspeed, like congrats. If you were getting five <laughs> different angles per week, cause that, that's all that, you are a hell of a creative strategist. If you are coming up with that many angles per week, but yeah, agreed. I think like the big problem is like we were talking about, like, Hey, you might, you might be on the cusp of unlocking something new, but usually like I actually had a, had a tweet the other day that kind of blew up where I was saying like, Hey, what happens if you got a great hook and a great hold and a great click through, but bad ROAS? almost everyone immediately identified like there's a mismatch between the ad and the lander. And I was really curious where people are going to be like, Oh, you got to change the ad or you got to change the lander. It was a little bit 50 50, but one of the best responses was you just need to match it up. And I was like, Hey, well, which one are you going to match? And it's like, well, I'm going to change the ad to match the landing page. My hypothesis is like majority of brands are going to do that because messing with the landing page has always been way more difficult than making changes at the ad level especially since like those 100%. landing pages were usually like super embedded into the Shopify experience. Got to get dev involved, got to get design involved. Is there an app conflict? 100%. Is there a theme conflict? So like how many over the last five years, amazing ideas have died or just been like morphed and changed in their concept to just be a slight variation of what already works to go to the landing page. <laughs> Dude, exactly. A hundred percent. I think about all of like, I mean, I'm biased because I worked really hard on it, right? But I think about all this like ad creative and all this copy that worked so hard to write that it just didn't convert as well as some of our like more catch all to catch all experiences did catch all ad to catch all advertorial or landing page or whatever it was, even the PDP. And we just were like, well, that angle doesn't work. Like it got people to click, but they aren't going to convert. And I think part of that is just like the evolution and I don't know, like the general D2C community, e-commerce community knowledge, like we're all growing over time. And there was an old way of doing things, which is that you build a landing page and you optimize that one landing page until you can like get it to whatever, three to 4% basically was like, you have a killer landing page. 1% was yeah. like industry standard. And so it was just like, great. How can I build creative to send it to this landing page so that it as our fearless CMO loves to say, make the money printer go burr. Um, <laughs> I had to toss that one in there. Um, but you're right. Like I had, I almost had perverse incentives because then I was like, okay, well, if other stuff that seems good and performs great at the top of the funnel isn't going to end up converting, then why am I even trying in the first place, right? When I have to work off of this landing page or this PDP. So interestingly enough, that brand that I used to work at um, just signed <laughs> to come to Vermont. Um, their new customer is a Vermont. So I'm super excited for them to get onboarded um, and to see the funnels that they build out because I think it's just going to be like uh, the dream. You're going to have to go <laughs> reboot all those creative angles you had in the past that just couldn't go anywhere. It's like, it was this one. It was this one. It was this one. Let's get the funnel yeah. ready to go. Um, <laughs> so, all right. We talked, we talked about role of the creative strategist, being able to find all these different angles, making sure that like the messaging's lining up, talked a little bit about how Vermont can potentially help with that. Like, what about in terms of the day to day of a creative strategist? Like, how do you maybe tools or like frameworks, like if someone is in that creative strategist role, like, how do you go about finding five angles per week? How do you go about finding oh. what you need to build this out? It's dude, it is objectively really hard. And I think it's one of those things that like took me 
years to get good at. And I still don't even think I was like exceptional. I don't think I was like great. I think I was just top end of good probably. Um, (laughs) Though our business did do very well. But all that being said, I think, um, I think that the answer to your question is, is that you can't silo yourself to just looking at like performance in one part of the funnel, like we talked about, right? Like you have to force yourself to get out of the tug of war. Um, and so when I started as a creative strategist, I was very much focused on like that creative role, right? Where it was like the hook rate, the whole rate, the engagement on that ad itself. And then as I evolved, then it it became like, okay, I'm willing to make some compromises when it comes to engagement. If, if I'm seeing the sales come through, right? So it was like, okay, I'm targeting better. The way that we thought about that was like, I'm targeting better with my creative where I'm getting the right people to click through. I always talk about this concept with great strategists and performance marketers, like the curiosity click. There's this trend for the longest time where people were doing literally anything like objectively crazy stuff in their ad creative, just to get people to watch the ad itself. Um, and like, yes, you probably got people to click through and yeah, that looks good for those like top of top of line, you know, numbers. Um, but like example, I remember there was this trend where people were doing like weird stuff with like paint or like pancakes at the hooks of ads. There was like people making weird niche pancake shapes or like balloons full of paint just as a hook, just to get people to look. And then it was like, and now here's an ad about a supplement. And you were like, why, why did I pay for these people to click through on my ad? Right? Like they're not your demo at all. So I think first thing is, is not just looking at your motion data or not just looking at your Facebook ads data or not just looking at your triple or our theme data, but it's like having a holistic view of your performance. Um, for me, what that looks like at the time, because the tools were not all as nifty and integrated as they are now is like, I had this monster spreadsheet. So that for literally every single ad that we were running at the time, um, I had like the ad ID and then all of the top level performance metrics, then all of the kind of like throughout the funnel performance metrics. And I used, um, it's not data validation, but I forgot what it is in like Google sheets where you can basically color, color score, like low to mm-hmm. high. And so I basically try and find like high sales, high spend, and then like yellow medium performance metrics that were like top of the line as a, you know, the more creative performance metrics. And I was like, great. Okay. I'm just going to like lean into whatever is like green, yellow, green. (laughs) That's where I went. And then when it came to like finding new angles, when I say new angles, I wasn't like coming up with completely five new ways to sell a supplement. It was more like, you know, you have buckets of angles of selling things. And then it was picking more deeply into sub pains or whatever sub problems. So like, for example, one month I may have been focusing on trying to get like sleep as the main angle to convert. And then every week I was trying to think about new ways to message. um, Why, when kids have poor sleep, it's like life ruining for parents. Right. So it's like, you're worried about your kid's health, your kid's not doing well at school. Right. Like these are all the sub angles. Like you're not getting any sleep as a parent. And then you start to feel like a crappy parent. And so it was like, okay, we start to see directional incremental moves in one broad angle. And then we dig deeper and deeper and deeper and expand. And then you like rehash and reorient the clips within the ad, or you slightly tweak the messaging and where, I wish I had more agency at the time was then to kind of take that through the funnel. Like we're talking about where then I could do deeper, like offer testing and even just like creative experimentation on what was being shown in the actual assets, you know, when someone landed on a PDP or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's, for me, it's just been about basically accepting like some medium grade creative performance metrics and then, looking at high spend scale and looking at what's, what's giving me whatever I was trying to operationalize towards. So like, was it just make the most money? Was it, you know, make the most money I can for the lowest acquisition cost? Or was it like just max out AOV and then figure out how to tweak other stuff later? I think the one challenge or like the biggest challenge of being a creative strategist, um, particularly if you are kind of uh, body doubling where you're managing all these performance metrics is like, you always have to, you just have to pick a thing to operationalize towards, right? So is it like 
make as much money as we can at all costs right now? <laughs> or is it, you know, make as much money as we can, but we cannot go past this customer acquisition cost? Is it this campaign that we're running right now is we are trying to max up a AOV as hard as we can and whatever it takes to get there, right? So it's like having a clear, even if it's not one metric, but a clear North Star goal and then building your strategy around that is like the only way to stay sane, in my opinion. <laughs> I, yeah, I think like, for the most part, when people are like trying to pick what that North Star is, like you're in the early days, like you're looking for scale or you're looking for efficiency. And I think like, as again, like what we talked about earlier, like things have gotten easy, like self optimizing, in a sense to help you with scale and to help you with efficiency. So I think like a lot of people and I think like, this is this is great for us is like a lot of people are kind of low at like a local optimal in the ad account. It's like, oh, I've like, I found these ways to be super efficient into a particular like funnel or through a particular campaign. And then like some people are now saying like, okay, how do I go find something that is net new? So like in your crazy spreadsheet, instead of having to look at like, okay, what is making the money printer go burr, even though like it's not necessarily my top angle and instead being able to look at your spreadsheet and be like, okay, what are some of these top angles that are falling off on the other side? And then being able to like line that up on the other side. But like before you said like, Hey, if, if Vermont was around when I was doing this, that would have been a godsend. Like, did you back then, like, did you feel like you had any control over that? Like, were you, cl were you only messing with ads and like nothing to do with the site? Did you have like some control? Was there some form of tool that you could use? Then I was not touching the site at all. So I had a counterpart on my marketing team who now pretty much runs the marketing team there. Shout out to him. Um, <laughs> but he was, he was responsible for pretty much everything post click and or everything after the click. And I was, I was responsible for everything kind of to that click. That was basically how our roles worked. And I see this very commonly across E2C e brands, even still. Um, and that was a, almost a different version of that push pull tug of war of like competing yep. interests that we tried to work as closely together as we could to achieve winning outcomes amongst both of us. Um, but yeah, I had what we would work together once we saw an ad, a new angle, something start to really scale and show promise. What would end up happening is we would work with, we would never change our PDP really, unless they were like, you know, we were running specific AV tests on specific things like that with his land. But when it came to the landing pages, if we felt like we had, you know, spent enough money on a particular angle and seen promising enough results, we would go and get a custom like advertorial or some sort of landing page built, but it would take like two weeks plus end to end, right. To get that built out. And then by the time that those two weeks came up, that thing that we thought we felt good about enough to get a landing page built for, like it might've all of a sudden started to tank, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or like. We might've had a totally new uh, perspective on what we wanted to build or what we wanted to message. And then we would go back into the editing mode and like we have to have a dev change the headlines on the page or the content and the advertorial. And then we're writing again. And then we change our mind again. You know what I mean? Cause like, that's the other thing with performance marketing and media buying is like, things are always changing. Consumer behavior is always changing. And it's not just like macroeconomic factors. It's like the Olympics are happening right now. And 3000 different brands decided to start running Olympic related memes, which is just like changing the algorithm and the, you know what I mean? Like the, basically I think of it like the real estate market, right? Like the supply and demand of the online ad buying space. And so your performance can, it's, hopefully you hope it's generally steady, but sometimes it can go like wonky one way or the other. And so when you're taking that time, not only like the cash uh, resource investment, but also the time resource investment and waiting to have something built, um, it can just be like really detrimental to not only the business, but also to your mental health. Because <laughs> you always feel like you're kind of, you're, you're moving and turning. I will say like tool stack wise though, um, I didn't have a triple L or North Beam back in the day, I would hundred percent. I'm not just saying that because I worked at triple oil, notice how I'm saying triple oil or North beam, all love, <laughs> but I would love to have like a source of truth, you know, data center that I could use and be like, this is just what we're going to use moving forward instead of all the different ad platforms exported into different sheets. So I think that's huge. Um, I think motion is great if you don't 
want to like have to finagle in the ad platforms with very specific creative metrics um, or you don't want people on your team in the ad account that don't need to be, which is a very real concern, Um, particularly if you have like a more conceptual creative, creative strategist where you don't want the risk of them. One time when I was very new, I literally deleted our best performing campaign ever. Don't know how I did it to this day. Um, and it was the worst night of my life. <laughs> so um, I think emotion, like solution like that is really great. Um, I use Foreplay now for saving ad inspiration and making notes and um, looking at other people's like landing pages and funnels even. Um, and then I recently have fallen in love with ReCharm, um, which is like a combo tool service. Uh, but the kind of TLDR is that you give them access to like your chaotic Google Drive folder of all of the content that you're getting produced. And they like organize it with a combination of AI and human hands to chunk out all of your clips. So um, it can be as broad as like, these are my hook clips, or it could be, for example, I saw a, a demo with Magic Spoon where it's like pouring cereal into a purple bowl specific, you know? Um, and so then you can go and build and like mix match your clips together for video creative um, and basically like try and build the best performing splices all together. Um, and it just get, helps you get there way faster, which I think is really huge. But like, I think those would be at least from like the creative specifically side tool stack where I would definitely lean. Um, but then obviously like Vermont is huge, Thank right? <laughs> Like, of course, Vermont is huge, right? Because then you can do the dream and build the whole thing end to end and have way more agency. So, um, but yeah, that was like, those were kind of all the tools that I wish existed back when I was in my last in-house role. Yeah. So to kind of summarize what we've been talking about, creative strategist, you were seeing this role explode. Like everyone's kind of looking for this and it makes sense why like media buying as like a thing is kind of becoming more of a I don't want to say it's a solved game but it's becoming more of like a just keep on feeding the machine and let the machine kind of like self optimize so making yeah. sure we have someone who is being more creative and strategic on what we're going to feed creative wise into the machine is becoming more important from your perspective like the tooling to look at how things are going through the funnel is very important. Like I, yes, I need to understand how the ad is performing, but I also need to understand how efficient that ad is at generating those dollars and having something like Vermont or just like to be more general, like being able to have control on the post click to line up the angles that I'm playing with. Because like, honestly, if there's one thing keeping me up at night in D2C right now, it's that like everyone is just creating a bunch of creative that works for like a small subset of funnels and just trying to find like small ways to get a little bit more efficient instead of like going and trying to find like a brand new way to grow and like get from where they are today to where they want to be in 10 years. You don't get to a billion adding by ones, right? Like you need to look for a few 5X, 10X things every now and then. Still got to find some ones in there, but not going to get to a billion adding by them. Totally. 100%, man. If I had from my back in the day, my crazy spreadsheet, my whole life, oh, would have been a totally different game. Put me back in. <laughs> hey, well, you, you have a chance here to take some of those angles you had in the past and put some Vermont funnels to them and see how well yeah. they, they would have done from back in the day. All right. Well, Lex, this has been amazing. Thanks for sharing all the knowledge. Appreciate you. Thanks, Tim.